and welcome to another episode of the knowledge show powered by knowledgecape my name is ahmed zaman and i will be your moderator for today's session for everyone who is new to this show uh, the knowledge show is an initiative by knowledgecape to bring leaders from different walks of life to have discussions on business talent development uh, learning and life in general the discussion in today's episode will be around the topic building a growth oriented culture and without further ado i would like to take this opportunity to introduce to you our guests first up is manu nanda at the helm of nolscapes india and apac business is manu nanda senior vice president and chief business officer a self initiator manu thrives on chasing audacious business goals his expertise lies in creating value for customers helping organizations with their talent transformation efforts across levels and delivering high business results a seasoned enterprise leader with 25 plus years of diverse corporate experience across fmcg petroleum retail automotives oil and gas and training and coaching manu has held leadership roles across channel management key accounts franchise operations and consulting outside of work manu is a movie buff an avid reader and a compulsive swimmer thank you so much manu for being part of this show it's absolutely a pleasure to be here amar and good to be with great company you got dr somya it's absolutely pleasure to be here thanks manu so our special guest for today's show is dr somya badgain who's currently the vice president strategic hr at gold star jewelry is also an hr gold medalist business transformation hr specialist with 20 plus years of transformation know how succession planning and business expansion through cultural and organizational changes in manufacturing and luxury businesses a phd in management and mba with dual specialization in marketing and international trade Somya is also a certified behavioral skill trainer as well as NLP practitioner certified by American Board of NLP. Somya is the author contributor to the Growth Hacking Book 2 along with being the world record holder in Golden World of Records. That's a great profile Somya. Thanks for uh, being on the show. Thank you so much for such a wonderful and uh... so a nice welcome and it's great to have uh, emmer you reach out to me and i'm sure the talks with manu would be something that i'm really looking forward to so thank you very much once again so as a tradition before we move on to the more serious discussions which uh, uh, connect with our uh, theme of the discussion we do a little rapid fire question round so uh, you know both of you get to know each other and our viewers also are aware of your individual personalities uh, i mean both of you might think that i've been watching a lot of karan johar and uh, you know coffee with karan shows but that's not true because uh, we at uh, i think uh, nolscape also believe that uh, learning is not fun without fun right so uh we'll start with the rapid fire questions and we'll go with manu first because he's the uh, uh internal guest here so manu this is a, a would you rather segment where you have to choose uh, one of the two options that i'll give you and the reason why you chose that right so we'll begin with manu and the first question is would you rather live without your phone for a week or live without your car for a year i think goes without saying live without my phone for a week i think that is the way of actually detoxifying your digital because all of us are so addicted to our phones that that gives you an opportunity to just throw it away and uh, can't live without my car because i love driving and love going out where i live so the choice is very clear i'm <laughs> that's a very smart answer manu i should say Uh, the next question for you is uh, would you rather quit watching movies or quit swimming this i picked up from your profile so <laughs> i made sure that it's a tough one for you so i would i think quit swimming because i can't stay without watching movies and last two years have been without swimming because of covid so i'm pretty used to it now so you know if if, if it's a choice 
can't give up Bollywood for sure. That's, oh, I didn't know Bollywood binging is, is your hobby. Which, which is the latest movie you watched? The latest was, of course, Jug Jug Jio, because that's the only one which is at a good, uh, you know, opinion. The rest of them are still struggling, I would say. <laughs> that's right. Very nice. Uh, we'll move to the next question, and it is, would you rather never get tired of working or never have the need to work? Uh, I would uh, pick the first one. I think work for me is kind of a, you know, work is worship as they say. So without me, work, I think you, I mean, your mental ability, your activeness, everything is with work. So I, I would pick that. Nice. Uh, the next question is, uh, would you rather be able to read people's minds or be able to teleport? Oh, wow. That's an interesting <laughs> one. All right. I know based on the past record, you really pick up some tricky questions. So I think I would prefer reading people's mind, you know, because it, it helps you connect better. And, you know, to establish those kind of relationships, I think that would be an easier option. I would say. But at the risk of sometimes getting too much information. <laughs> that's, that's possible. <laughs> right. So the last question in this segment for you, uh, Manu, is, would you rather never be able to eat your favorite food again or never be able to visit your favorite travel destination? I would put, pick the second uh, one. Travel destination has to be there. So uh, and for me, it's always been a good beach holiday. I can't give that up. That's the only way I, I feel, you know, at least once or twice in a year, you get to relax. I would pick the second choice. Nice. Which, which is your favorite destination though? All these. All these. Very nice. And, and your favorite food? Because we yeah, have Punjabi, so it goes without saying the regular good butter chicken and uh, naan is what we are relish on. Wow. I'm almost drooling here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, very well done, uh, Manu, on that segment. Uh, Somme, you have a really tough competition here. He's given some really smart answers. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a hamper, but Probably when we publish this episode, we'll have sort of a poll and whoever wins will try and arrange for one. <laughs> Good so, one. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll go with you next in the same yeah. Would You Rather segment. And the first one for you is, would you rather eat at the best fine dining restaurant with family or at a popular highway dhaba with your best friends? Oh God, that's a tough one. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> fine dining with family. Uh, because it was family. Otherwise, it's always dhaba because I don't like, you know, you have to be very prim and proper and eat in a sudden way. <laughs> That's not me. <laughs> That's nice. Uh, the next one is, would you rather have a world without diseases or without injustice? Without injustice. Hands down, because it is, uh, it is a world which actually comes forward in, in equality in every sense of the word. So diseases can be cured, but once a person is scarred through injustice, that scar stays. So yes, a world without injustice. Very interesting, Samya. Uh, we'll move to our next question for you. And it is, would you rather lead an outstanding team with boring people or just above average team with interesting people? Above average team with interesting people. Again, you can always pull them up with their diverse interests. So, yes. <laughs> That's nice. Again, uh, uh, next question is, would you rather give up reading or give up music? <laughs> you know, you know, that's a good catch to end, you know. I, I mean, yeah, that's that's it's a googly man. Can you can you rephrase it? Lifeline, anything, please. Hello, <laughs> you, you can phone a friend or you can phone take help from Manu. <laughs> yes, Manu who bails me out. <laughs> So, yeah, I think um, uh, Manu, I, I think we would agree to something that I would uh, definitely not give up uh, reading because music, as music transports you, so does reading. You know, you create your own visuals, your own imagery. And also it's, it's a, it, I would call that an indulgence in today's world wherein you don't get so much of a time. Music, you can just drive and just listen to it without concentrating on the content. But uh, when you are with the book, you are like 
you know, melded in, in what the author is trying to, you know, convey through words. So that is what I would say. That's a brilliant answer, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, very, very good response, I would say. A uh, last one for you, Soumya, in this segment, and it is, would you rather go back in historical times of kingdoms and palaces or in the future era of flying cars? Always in kingdoms and palaces. Who doesn't love the romance of the Victorian era with the women being true women and men being the men? Not, you know, the way that the world has turned out today. Not taking away any feminism. Yes, I really love... Uh, you know, when when the soft gender was the soft gender and men were doing the task that they were supposed to do. Yes, in today's world, we do uh, require the fusion, but I travel back in time any day. Wow. I think uh, both of you have been brilliant in this round. So I think we leave it to the people who watch this show ultimately to decide who's the winner. But with, with that, we'll uh, now move to a little more serious discussion where we'll discuss the theme for today, which is building a culture for growth, right? And my question uh, would be first uh, to you, Manu, because we uh, read so much about growth and uh, business leaders talking about that term a lot. But for different organizations and in different contexts, it has a different uh, meaning for people, right? So what, what does growth growth actually mean for businesses today? And what, according to you, is meaningful growth in today's era? Great question, Amar. So I think if you talk of growth traditionally, if you go, you know, what's been spoken of and, uh, you know, growth for any organization goes to protecting your top line and your bottom line and making sure that the organization is profitable. My interpretation of growth, I would say, and that's more related to the changing external environment right now, whatever has happened in the last two years, I think it is about giving your customers a stellar experience, which can ultimately relate to growth. It is about creating a customer loyalty, which is not easy, which can you know, protect your uh, top line and your bottom line to a large extent. And at the same time, you know, ensuring that the vision and the mission of the organization is absolutely intact and percolated down to the last person in the organization so that growth is there always. That's, that's what I think of growth. That's uh, really well put, Manu. Uh, Soumya, what's, what's your take on that? So let's understand what growth is in the organizational or in the corporate paradigm. So you have strategic growth, you have internal growth, you have organic growth, you've growth through mergers and acquisition. So primarily four types of growth is what we see. Now, when we see these kind of growth, what do they ultimately lead to? They ultimately are all queued down to just one thing, which is valuation. And how would you increase the valuation of any organization? Right? Chai a balance sheet le lije, chai uske stock values le lije, and anything. But like you rightly asked, is about what do you understand by meaningful growth? There is the catch. You know, you can build beautiful businesses, but if the business is not sustainable, if the business does not hold relevance, then I don't think so that any of these growth is at all, uh, you know, in sync with the meaningful thing. And then Last but not the least, what is it that you're giving back to the society? And I'm absolutely not talking about the CSR activity. It can be in more ways than just this, the CSR activity, you know? So how are you creating that impact in the society by being you, right? Uh, let's take, uh, for example, Tata's, you know? Uh, Mr. Ratan Tata does not do anything. He just comes there, you know, cuts his cake and you see his his very young age sitting with him. And that chap does did just one thing. And what did he do? He just put colors on the tray, which used to you know, glow those radium colors. And that's wonderful. That's how you're creating an impact in the society indirectly. So I think that is what is meaningful growth when you're growing beyond numbers and creating values and valuation beyond what is in the PNL sheet? Absolutely. I think uh, what <clears throat> Dr. Somya has shared is 
Absolutely brilliant. Because just to add two more points, uh, you know, so it has to be a growth with purpose. I'm a how I see it. You know, if you call it meaningful growth, it has to be growth with purpose. And the second part I see again based on the external environment right now, it has to be growth with a lot of ambition. So when you say ambition, it has to be you know the ability of the leaders and the organization to take those bolder strategic initiatives. Uh, because of the unprecedented times outside and ensure that, you know, the organization, the employees are absolutely on track in the right way. Thank you so much, Manu and, and Soumya. And I couldn't have agreed with you more. You touched upon really important anecdotes that, uh, you know, uh, talk about meaningful growth today. So my next question is, in a way, an extension of the previous question itself, where we'll, we'll discuss about inclusive growth because uh, growth is important, but how do you sustain that? And how do you really, uh, you know, uh, make it inclusive? Soumya, uh, would you like to go first for this one? Sure. So uh, uh, more often than not inclusive or creating inclusion is just a cosmetic thing that organizations are doing just to tick mark things. But real inclusion is EDI equality, diversity, and definitely when you have both of them, you will become inclusive, right? So in today's world where even views are so polarized and affecting what we're doing is not a culture that India is, uh, you know, bred with, and certainly not the culture that corporates can strive on. So unless and until you don't have that kind of an inclusive environment when people can boldly come out and say, hey, I think as a uh, top management, you did a friend connection United Kingdom on your project. I think that is where I say it is a culture of equality. It is a culture of freedom. It is a culture which is embracing everyone together. Unless and until you don't give voice to people, unless and until the culture is not that of creating and embracing even the aberrations. You would need to, you know, embrace the aberrations also, frictions also, but still if you can wade through it, smile through it and come out champions, that's what is, uh, you know, uh, inclus inclusivity to me, uh, respecting people's views and embracing, you know, the idiom in its, like, find perfection in imperfection. Thanks, Amir. I think that's a very uh, thought uh provoking perspective you have given here. Manu, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Soumya has covered everything. Uh, it, I, I would just put in two points. One is, uh, you know, something what Soumya has already mentioned. Uh, it's all about creating that safe environment, an environment of inclusivity where people feel respected. It's creating a culture of uh, you know, open sharing within the organization where they're free to express themselves, which sometimes, you know, a lot of organizations don't entertain that or don't encourage that because it's more of a top-down kind of, and things have changed. Again, I'm going back to the same thing and I'm going to be speaking about it. Uh, the ways of working has changed, you know, so what was happening in 2019, 2020 is very different what's happening in 2022 and who knows what 23 is like that. So it has to be a culture of uh, bringing people together, a lot of collaboration happening, open communication, so that people feel safe. You know, that culture of safety needs to be there, which will help the organization uh, to move towards its uh, ultimate goals, as I would say. Thanks, Manu. Uh, so my next question, uh, again, pertains to the fact that we are all uh, operating in a hybrid environment today. Right. In such a scenario, how important is trust building in the process of nurturing this uh, culture of growth? And how are leading organizations building this trust both with internal and external uh, stakeholders? So, um, the organization that I'm a part of is, uh, and I'm into gems and jewelry industry. So, uh, this, se business hota hai yaan, but this is very interesting for people to know that Antwerp may do admi him. They hold each other's hand in Cuba handkerchief aata hai, and ye apne ke ishare se, they uh, seal the deal on the diamond pockets. And usme koi likhta nahi. there's nothing written, nothing. It's just between me and you. You are off the table. The money gets transferred. The goods gets delivered. Now that's trust. So I come from an, uh, an ecosystem 
which fosters trust to another level. Now, we are sitting with high value goods in, in the manufacturing where we have diamonds and we have gold. If we don't have trust, then how will, will we be able to produce the kind of ornaments that women or men in the, around the world would love to wear? So that's uh, taking into consideration um, the organization structure. Now, when it comes to teams, I have to trust that the delivery of a particular assignment will, will, will happen if I have entrusted the job to someone. Without the trust, without me always having that helicopter parent kind of an environment, you will feel claustrophobic. You will not be able to spread your wings. And when an employee is unable to spread the wings, then I become the banding tree. So then I will be the first person who is going to stop, stop the growth of my future leaders who are actually going to be the, uh, the people who are going to take the organization further. So trust in every facet is very important. And last but not the least, how does it affect me? If I don't trust, then I will always be in doubt. When I'm in doubt, I'm not at peace. And when I'm not in peace, how am I going to ever perform better? Or how am I ever going to exact the work out of someone? So, you know, it is at all the levels that you need to have that trust, hands down, anytime. Yeah, blind faith, mat rakhe, ki koi bhi aapko chuna laga ke chala jai. But trust is a good idea. So there's a difference between faith, trust, belief. You know, so that would be my submission. That that's a very uh, insightful uh, response, Somya. A lot of what you said was sort of an eye opener for me. That still those practices are there, right? Uh, Manu, uh, what's your take? Good question again, Amar. Uh, so for me, you know, it goes without saying. Uh, you know, human beings are creatures of emotions. You know, and they're not creatures of logic, if I may say. Uh, so for trust to be there, it's it's a human value that, you know, two people interacting with each other, there is no trust, there is no forward movement. So it, you know, translates into an organization. So trust building is not just within the organization, between employees or between the employee and the manager or the employee and the leadership team or it's also about the external trust that you build with your stakeholders outside, with your partners, with your vendors, with your customers. Uh, you know, it, it has to be part of the organization's DNA. That goes without saying. And how can it get into motion or how can it get implemented? I think it needs to start from the top. So leaders need to walk the talk. It is only then will it trickle down to the last person in the organization. Leaders need to create that openness, uh, you know, that transparency, that open communication where uh, the feeling of trust, respect is there uh, for them to be engaged or for any employee to be engaged or for the workers to be engaged and work, you know, with their full heart and soul rather than just being disengaged. That is how I would put it. Anyway. Thanks, Manu. And, and since you spoke about openness, that also leads me to my next question. Uh, it uh, basically revolves around the fact that often the fear of consequences of failure leads to a lot of people not taking initiatives or maybe sometimes deflecting blame, avoiding issues or uh, hiding uh, limitations and those kind of things, right? So how, how can organizations really ensure a safe environment for employees where they feel supported and secure? and confident enough to try new things at the workplace. You know, how I would put it, Emma, is uh, it's important for, organize, for anyone to actually fail first, understand where things didn't go wrong, then be super successful in everything you do. And why I say that is there's actually an interesting quote by, I think it was Peter Drucker who said that people who don't make mistakes are not creative people. So if you want to be creative, if you want to you know, have some kind of uh, uh, success coming out, you need to fail. And for organizations to ensure uh, that people are, you know, they feel safe and are able to express themselves, uh, it has to be an environment where the leaders can be uh, good listeners, 
because good listening is a great skill. If a leader does not have good listening skills, you know, it's actually going to move towards a path of destruction, I would say. So having good listening skills, understanding what is the pulse of the team that you lead or the people in the organization, what are the vibrations that you get from them. And it's only then that you react or respond to ensure that, you know, people feel safe and are able to communicate, share, learn, coach each other in a very, very safe environment. That's uh, really well put, Manu. Uh, I would take Soumya's opinion on that now. So uh, again, Manu has worded it beautifully well here, but uh, I'll just, uh, you know, share an experience with you. So I had joined from rubber industry. Okay? Now rubber industry is an industry where we do business in tons. Okay, so the, uh, when you look at the numbers, the, the three decimals don't make any difference. You round it off because we don't have kgs in tons. Cut back, I joined the gems and jewelry industry, diamond industry. Right? Three decimals means dollars. Dude, you can't round it off. Now I'm saying, I was in the new IT industry. I'm very smart as an MBA chip on the shoulder. What do you know, dwellers, bloody. So I rounded it off for Sari PIS, product information sheet, bridge the mene, bilkul dunke ki chot pe, uthake, to one of the biggest retailers in US. Okay, they have 4,000 shops. So her XQ, matlab one multiplied by 4,000 to aane hi tha apke pas. Wow. <laughs> Kali to gai. I would like to see you in the room. Fair enough, sir. I thought I had a pat on the shoulder and all. No? I thought I had a pat on Who made that sheet for you? I said, I. I said, Achha, uh, did you go through the system? I said, yes, sir. I went through the system. Achha, how did you do this? I said, sir, I did it. I said, sir, I did it. 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 He held his head and he sat down. I said, Mar gai, Somya, bhaag ja, where to find covers? Okay. Why he says, Bhez diya apne sheet. I said, Yes, sir. I said, okay, sit down. He took a pen and a pencil and a calculator. There was a reason why he took a pen and a pencil. Unhone pen se pura calculation kiya. Okay. Or fir wo sheet phaar di. And he made me do that calculation with pencil till the time I got the formula ingrained in my brain. And he said, I said, sir, and I was sweating through my palms because I had made a loss of $5 million. Wow. All right. And he said, it's fine, but I know next time you will not do it. Even while I'm talking to you, my hands are shaking. But that one experience where you're allowed to make a mistake, where you're, you talked through your mistake and where a leader actually handholds you through whatever journey you take and, and still says, it's okay, I have your back. This is one thing that has gone wrong, but together we are still a team. I think that's what actually goes back to your previous question of trust. And also comes back to this question of, you know, uh, coming out and uh, claiming to the world that, yes, it's all okay. You know, consequences will be there. But in the larger interest, he knows that this is a talent. I don't want to let go of the talent. You know, mistakes we accept here, aage bane life mein. So that's, that's the learning. And I, I still hold on to that learning very dear because that's what even I do with my team members. New bachche jab aate hain, MBA aspirants aate hain, to bohat maza aata hai jab wo bohat, you know, theoretical knowledge ke saath aate hain aur yahaan ke dekhte hain, to kuch hai nahi aisa. Ye to dunia pa lat gai hai yahaan pa. But then it's fun to, you know, again, nurture them, tell them it's okay, it's fine, we're there for you. So that's what I would like to share. Thank you. Very, very interesting, Soumya. And uh, I'd be very honest when I say I literally got goosebumps when I was listening to that story. Uh, but that again, uh, because you mentioned about how your MD explained things to you and the significance of small things, right? So my question again, the next one entails to how leaders make an impact or what is their role in 
establishing a culture which is oriented around growth so may if you can continue with uh, sure. so yeah. have you have a movie dekhi hai devil wears prada okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. devil wears prada okay meryl streep ki movie hai and has her own scene and has been has been so uh, it's about a boss and a subordinate in a luxury um, you know industry where they are selling um, or they are into the business of fashion clothes line ka hai so it's made book of beautiful um, you know a incidents hota hai okay where in and has way comes from a very uh, sophisticated kind of um, you know mass communication background and she wanted to get into the wall street kind of writing you know when she wanted to write down unfortunately fortunately paise ki kami thi so she joined the fashion house so wahan par ja ke unko ye lagta tha ki are tum log kya bakwas you know you just talk about some clothes and think like that so here meryl streep was trying certain clothes and uh, then and had way in her most shabbiest and not the fashion conforming kind of dressing sense walks in and she starts taking notes and she just uh, gives a smirk this meryl streep turns to her and said what's that for and uh, she says it's why are you so worried about what kind of blue to go it is just blue and the lecture that she gives and the shades of blue that she describes and why did the designer create this blue and where did this stem from that's what leadership and fascinating is all about when you get into the nitty gritties of where why when how you know and leaders always would need to you know hand hold all of their subordinates and you know i would say that my parents gave me my dna so similarly the professional dna is given to me by by my leaders so what i am today is because of the dna that i have accumulated and assimilated inside me of the various leaders that i have worked with and i am just a reflection of what they are in my own tiny ways we all are aaj main yahan baith ke baat kar rahi hu so kisi ne mujhe is cheez ke liye bhi train kiya hoga knowingly i'm knowing you aaj aapke sath hu i have manu with, uh, with us i have you with us and i'm still learning so much from you so you know whether i am reporting to you or not is not the key the key is there is someone there at the position and you're just a non response so leaders always will you know pave ways for you for more learning for facilitating you in more ways that even you are aware of hame pata hi nahi hota you know jab hum you know when we do the johari window we have a lot of blind spots it's they who bring the spotlight on the bright spot and create this beautiful us so that's what i would like to say thanks a lot somya uh, you've been absolutely spot on with your anecdotes and analogies so uh, 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 very well responded to that uh, manu uh, uh, what is because you have held a lot of leadership roles across uh, organizations and even across sectors how significant do you think uh, is the role of a leader in establishing uh, the organization's culture i think goes without saying and i think somya you has covered everything in terms of you know what is it that a leader has learned over a period of time from the leaders that they would have worked with somya that's that's a brilliant point and i think it's the same story for me also you know having worked in various organization sectors when you've reached a certain point in your time where you know you are in a similar role so you try and pick the best things in terms of okay what did i learn from here what did i learn from here and what did i learn from here so that culture of growth or the culture of safety that we've been talking about you know it's for me it's like uh, you know how would i feel if i if my boss spoke rudely to me or to go back to the instance where you know somya had a good boss who helped her understand that if it's a 5 million loss it is a loss but what is your learning from it or was it a boss who just came and tore you apart so you know what which side would you pick and that is where i think it is all about understanding where you are at this point in your journey making the 
people you work with feel absolutely safe so that they can come and talk to you. And the last point, I think it's all about learning and coaching from each other. So you learn even from the people you lead, because there are so many things that they will bring on the table, which you might not be even aware of. And that is something what you call as reverse mentoring, you know, kind of a thing. And I, I, I am absolutely, you know, I've seen so many examples where I've struggled on certain elements of technology, where I've reached out and said, hey, can you come and help me fix this? I'm not able to go and, you know, People with four years, five years of experience in the corporate world would solve that problem within, say, two minutes or three minutes, where I would be struggling for the you know, last 30 minutes. So absolutely. So it has to be uh, you know, a culture of learning, peer-to-peer -peer learning, reverse mentoring. It has to be open coaching, goes without saying. Thanks, Manu. And uh, my, my next question, I would like you to take first also, because I, I, for me personally, I feel this is a very important question because a lot of times we talk about culture in conferences, read about it in blogs and have these discussions in shows like these, right? But do you actually see culture becoming a critical aspect of organization strategy? Do you see it becoming, uh, you know, assuming a strategic role in the organization? I think it is, uh, Emmer, and why I would say that is because, uh, you know, there are two ways that you see culture evolving. One is where a lot of organizations uh, follow a culture of performance, where for them performance is everything. You know, there is nothing that moves without performance. And, you know, in such kind of organization, there is a sense of uh, toxic culture which sets in. It is you know, people feel unsafe because it is just kind of an open public appraisal happening all the time, which is not, you know, good for the employee. And, you know, it's not creating what we've been speaking about, that safety. So it has to be a culture, which is uh, uh, a culture of growth, a culture of communication, a culture where leaders can actually exhibit those attributes where, uh, you know, they talk about change happening, change for good. It can be a culture of creating that ownership, uh, giving ownership for the individual to take certain initiatives and build on it and create a value for himself or the team that they work under. Or at the same time, you know, having a sense of accountability, where if you are in a culture of growth, uh, you know, accountability is a key, key word, you know, that is absolutely where you take that responsibility. So to just to sum up, uh, Emmer, and to you know say a one-line thing for the question that you uh, put forward, culture has to be part of a strategy. Otherwise, strategy would just remain on a piece of paper with no execution happening today. That's really well put, Manu. Uh, Soumya, would you like to add something to that? So I'll go back to uh, a very wise saying that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You know. So that's what we've grown up hearing. You know? So I guess that that one sentence sums it up all, that without a culture, who's going to drive your strategy? Who's going to incubate any new things that are going to come up? What are we going to talk about innovations if the culture is not supportive enough? How will you create diversity in the skill sets of the people around if you don't have a culture? If you don't have a culture, how are we going to talk about succession planning? You know, so there are so many aspects to the culture which we take so lightly. And there are organizations that are at various levels of maturity. So we need to understand those levels of maturity. For example, a level one organization will have a very dictatorial kind of a culture, very authoritative kind of culture because they're still forming an organization. A level five organization will have in a culture which is more forgiving, which is more relaxed, which is more in tuned to becoming visionaries and creating those visionaries in the society. So that's what culture does. Aaj aap humare bhi haan par dekhiye, hum to Bharat Varsh ke loge, hum sivai sanskriti ke aur kisi aur chiz ki baati nahi karte hain. So what is culture? Culture is nothing but what and the ways of holding on to tradition and yet infusing the modernity into it. So that's what, and that's what takes the organization great places to work at. 
really really nice uh, perspective there somya and i would like you to take the next question first and uh, it it uh, basically revolves around how modern day learning and training methods have changed with the influx of technology and also because of covid-19 people working in a hybrid model and you somehow have to reach out through different uh, virtual mediums for these learning and uh, uh, you know training uh, schedules as well right so do you see this uh, a modern day learning and training methods having the power to transform work culture and make it an engine for growth uh before we discuss about training needs i would like to um, also touch upon the uh, topic of the need for such things so like you rightly said jaise covid aaya to hum to manufacturing wale and that too in gems and jewelry so work from home <laughs> kya bhai kaise how is it matlab hum itne itne se diamonds itne se sone logo ke ghar pe to nahi bhej sakte the jewelry bana ke de do hume or not working for us right the another thing is that when we were taking interviews for the designers okay so they have to design something show to us show us their portfolios but how would we vet it you know whether the portfolio is is theirs or someone else's because that happens a lot so we give them a design brief on which they design on on that table अब करे कैसे आज के पहले किसी ने ना जूम यूज किया है ना स्काइप यूज किया है ना गूगल मीट यूज किया है किसी ने कुछ नहीं यूज किया क्योंकि हमारे जो कारीगर हैं वो कारीगर हैं मोबाइल फोन में यूट्यूब और इंस्टाग्राम के अलावा टिकटॉक वो भी बंद कर दिया सरकार ने बट लाइफ उसी के आजू बाजू में थी सो वी इवॉल्व वी यूज दीज मीडियम्स टू स्टार्ट टीचिंग पीपल हाउ टू यूज दीज मॉडर्न प्लेटफॉर्म्स करेक्ट so yes technology didn't come to our aid now when we started taking interviews especially for these designers so we used to make them sit on with their cameras on on a console and they used to design sare ke sare google meet pe aate the they used to design and then we were evaluating their complex the concentration the complexities of the design the closeness to the brief that was given to them ek aur cheez hui i'm also attached to the education system right so my daughter when she went to uh, manchester wahan par ye hua ki sare professors to bhai 70 70 years ke hain online kya baat kar rahe hain kisi ne suna hi nahi ye kis studio ka naam hai zoom cumbersome i have steps i can't have sit online and uh, you know glare at the screens it's not my time plus someone is from china someone is from india someone is from japan different time zones how is the professor going to teach technology again came to an aid where in sessions were recorded beamed to students who were unable to you know attend lectures okay in the manufacturing thing now we were also talking about the trust factors so hamare karigar were there because we were allotted only 33% of the workforce is allowed to come for the exports so but, but we had cameras or cameras hamare sirf cctv ke paas hote the aaj hamare mobile pe hai we can see what is happening in the organization uh, through the technology and we can say ki are ye ye galat setting kar raha hai people were Uh, confined you know one of our production head is in bulgaria he would see from bulgaria what's happening at the desk of an artisan and say hey you going wrong there technology so yes need will always come into your training and development identification tnis and then from that on you create your indices and indexes and move on so yes technology has definitely played its role when it comes to you know um facilitating and these are all real life examples that we have seen happening and i'm i'm absolutely sure manu would have uh, more to add to this because this is what i have experienced again a uh, very uh, insightful uh, perspectives there somya manu what what's your take on the modern day learning and training and its influence on uh, building a culture or uh, i think amar uh... why this question is the easiest question to me and to us is because we are in the business of learning and also using technology for learning 
And, uh, you know, absolutely agree with what Soumya said. I think uh, what's happened again, going back to the last two years that I'm referring to again and again, and our experiences, because, you know, we work with a lot of learning heads, we work with a lot of CHROs, HR heads. And when this transition was happening, you know, where people were now being asked to go home and, you know, it was that work from home culture starting, say, mid of 2020 when everything started, uh, there was a lot of disruption, a lot of organizations struggling to adopt to technology, which was not even there at that point of time. You know, so for me, as such, I would say that technology has actually enabled the learner to move from just being a passive learner to an active learner to an, you know, a fail, something that we use in Nolscape where it's more about application-based learning. Uh, you know, it's, it's working in your own safe environment, whether you're working from home or you're working, say, in a hybrid way, you still have started coming to the office. You know, you have that safe environment to take your decisions, what we've been uh, speaking about. And also for the organizations now, it is an opportunity, uh, especially for the traditional Indian organizations who were delaying their digital transformation, as I would say, uh, you know, it's actually been, and you know, a kind of a, given them kind of a momentum that now is the time to move to the next level and include technology as part of your learning. So, what it has helped, and you know, how is it helping the growth engine for the organization? One is trying to reduce the skill gap that existed earlier. Secondly, I would say the productivity to a large extent has increased because people can understand technology and apply technology to a large extent. And the third and the most critical part is also about the ability to, uh, you know, something that, again, you know, coincidentally, we talk about in Nolscape a lot is about being future ready for your next role. So that future readiness can only come if you understand technology use technology, which will ultimately help the growth engine for the organization. Thank you so much, Manu. Uh, that brings us to the end of the theme of these discussions, but it has been really wonderful and a very uh, fantastic discussion because uh, uh, it, it comes closest to the idea of this show of being candid and really honest discussion here. So congratulations to both of you for that. Right, but uh, that also means that we are not uh, strangers anymore. We were probably an hour ago, but not anymore. And that also means that we also have formed a first impression of each other. And that brings me to the final segment of today's show, which is our first impression, right? So Soumya, I'll start with you. Sure. So based on your first impression of Manu, uh -huh. If he wasn't a human being, but a man-made object, yeah. what would he be? A man-made object? Yeah. I would rather have made. him as a teddy bear. He's so warm, <laughs> so welcoming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is acceptable as an answer as well. Yeah, he, he is absolutely adorable in the way that, uh, you know, he connects and uh, he, he talks and he brings out... Uh, you know, that entire camaraderie in a panel as an idiot. <laughs> so, yes, uh, so that's what my impression would be. Thank you so much. Thanks, Soumya. Uh, Manu, uh, based on your first impression of Soumya, if she was a country, which one would that be? So, you know, Great question again, Emma. And I don't know from where you, you know, do your yes, research. Hey, Manu, he's calling you because <laughs> this is to do with Africa, and I know this joke. <laughs> so, so it's difficult for me to say, you know, which country. But what I can say about Soumya is, you know, she's and I and Soumya, you may, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. She's one person. If you sit with her in person, she's going to be absolutely fun. You know, in terms of the conversations, in terms of bringing out the brilliant uh, anecdotes that you brought out, Soumya, and, you know, it's going to be a laughter, right? Yeah. Sitting together, relax, relaxing, maybe, yeah. with, you know, a cup of tea, coffee, or whatever the preferred beverage is. Uh, 
you know, so if you want to relate fun to any country, MR, I give the choice to you now. Which country would you relate fun to? No, since you have traveled so much, if you can't escape this question because you <laughs> have traveled in fact a lot of countries. So which country embodies fun for you? Yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll go to the country that I'm traveling. I said I'll only explore because that's a safe country, a, a, a fun country. Uh, you know, so it brings in elements of everything. A great culture, I would say. Uh, you know, I will not go towards the West because right now West is under a lot of disruption. So a safe country, I would say. If you ask me for a country, I would say that right now. That's great. Uh... Manu and Soumya, I had a lot of fun hosting this particular show and uh, yeah, take care and thank you for joining us. Uh, we will keep you updated whenever we uh, publish this, right? And you have a great time and a great weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Soumya. Lovely thank connecting. You. Thank you, Manu. Thanks, Emmer. Bye. Lovely Bye, connecting. Bye, Soumya. Bye, Bye, Manu. Thank you once again. Bye.